Well, good afternoon, everyone, or hello, everyone, for those of you joining elsewhere in the world. Uh, my name is Matt Greenhall, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director of Research Libraries UK. And it gives me a real pleasure to welcome you all here to today's webinar, which will see the launch of RUK's manifesto for the digital shift in research libraries. We've been really delighted by the response from the community, both to the manifesto and to today's event itself. So thank you all for joining us. And wherever you are in the world, we hope that you, your friends, colleagues and families are safe and well during these most uncertain of times. As you will have seen, today's webinar is convened by Research Libraries UK. RL UK is a consortium of 37 of the UK and Ireland's most significant research libraries. Our membership is really diverse. And of our 37 members, three of our members are the UK's national libraries, the British Library, the National Library of Wales, and the National Library of Scotland. 33 of our members are university libraries throughout the UK, and also one member in the Republic of Ireland, Trinity College Dublin. The Welcome Collection in London is also one of our members. <clears throat> For our members, REK has four key purposes. We're here to convene our members around some of the core issues that they face as organisations through our events, our conferences, and our member networks. We're here to represent our members, to provide them with a collective voice. We're here to support them around some of the key issues that they face as research libraries through our research, through our training, and through our strategic programmes. And we're also here to advocate on their behalf to publishers, to funders, to government and policy makers. RLUK is a champion for our members and their interests run through everything that we do. And this is best represented by the contents of our strategy, Reshaping Scholarship. The digital shift in research library collections, audiences, operations and services has a really prominent place within our strategy reflecting the interest that all of our members have in this area. As a result of this, since 2017, our UK has been working to support our members as they navigate the digital shift and its implications for their organizations. We've worked with our members by conducting surveys, through research and events to try and capture their current experiences. What does this mean for them now? Yet in the last year, we've also turned our attention to the future and we've begun asking the question, what will the research library of the future look like? And what impact is the digital shift likely to have upon this? We've done this first and foremost by convening a working group formed of nine colleagues drawn from across our UK's member libraries and our member networks. This working group has worked with the RUK community to create a vision for the future of the research library in relation to the digital shift. And the manifesto that we're launching today is the product of this work. You'll be hearing from many members of our digital shift working group throughout today's webinar. So today's event will provide an overview of the origins, of the contents, and of the ambitions of our UK's digital shift manifesto. As you will have already seen, today's agenda is divided into two parts. So in the first part of today, we'll be hearing from three speakers, two of which are from our Digital Shift Working Group. Ms. Ukaka, University, uh, Director of University Libraries and Archives at the University of York and RLUK board member, and Torsten Reimer, Head of Research Services at the British Library and Chair of our Digital Shift Working Group. We'll then hear a recorded presentation from James Hetherington, Director of Digital Research Infrastructure at UK Research and Innovation, UK's funding agency for research and science. Now, unfortunately, due to unforeseen events, James can't be with us today, but has very kindly recorded his presentation and is also um, happy to receive questions via social media. At the end of these three presentations, we'll have time for a short comfort break. Then in the second part of today's webinar, we'll be hearing from other members of our UK's Digital Shift Working Group. Sarah Thompson, Michelle Blake, Lor uh, Lorraine Beard, 
and William Nixon. This second half of the webinar will involve hearing from you as a community about your experiences of the digital shift and in particular how COVID-19 has impacted upon your operations and your work in relation to the digital shift. And today's webinar will finish with a call to action and an invitation for all of you to work with our UK and its members in the realisation of the ambitions within the Digital Shift Manifesto. So thank you once again for joining us today. And this is really what you can expect and what we hope to achieve during the webinar. Now, before I hand over to our first speakers, there are a few bits of housekeeping. Firstly, you will have noticed that microphones and videos have been turned off um, during this webinar, but we would still love to hear from you. If you have any questions for our panel, please do submit, the, submit these via the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom interface. You can see this on the bottom of the Zoom panel. These questions will then be posed directly to our panelists and we'll respond to these during the Q&A session in the second part of today's webinar. Please do not post questions in the chat. Please do use the Q&A function. We'll also like to hear from you via a Mentimeter survey and I'll say a little bit more about this in a moment. The hashtag for today's session is RUKDigiShift and please do share any thoughts or opinions that you have via the hashtag via Twitter. And then finally, we will be recording today's session and we'll make this freely available on the RUK website shortly after. We are really grateful to have so many of you joining us today from such a wide variety of organizations and from around the world. And we would love to hear your thoughts and your experiences. In the email that you will have received regarding joining today's webinar, whether towards the end of last week or today, you will have also received a link to a short Mentimeter survey, and a link is here on screen. This Mentimeter survey has, uh, consists of six very short questions in regards to your experiences of the digital shift and also how these have changed during the COVID-19 crisis. If you haven't already done so, please do take the time to complete this survey. It only takes a few moments and we'll be using the results from this during some of the discussion in the second part of today's webinar. So please, if you can spare a moment, complete the survey. So thank you very much. So now it gives me a great pleasure having walked through the itinerary and the housekeeping to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Masood uh, Kokov, he's Director of University Libraries and Archives at the University of York, and he's also an REUK board member. Masood is also the champion of the digital shift strand of REUK's strategy, and he'll be providing an overview of the digital shift from his perspective as a board member and from uh, his institution. So over to you, Masood. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, and thank you for the introduction as well. I'm just going to share my screen, so bear with me. Right, so I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen now. And I just wanted to start by saying thank you for being on the, on the webinar and for showing your interest in the Manifesto for the Digital Shift in Research Libraries. As Matt mentioned, I'm the RUK board champion for the Digital Shift. And today I'll be taking you through some of my own thoughts, some of my own perceptions of where we need to be as a research library um, or as a consortium of research libraries in the future. And with a 10 year vision, but hopefully with some building blocks in the middle. Uh, and then Torsten later on will um, we'll further build on that as part of the manifesto description. So first of all, I want to start by saying that uh, digital shift is an important strand of our UK strategy. And broadly speaking, digital cuts across all portfolios of the work of research library, including collections, uh, with a particular focus on born digital collections, digitized collections, data, including research data, educational data, other data, uh, including open educational resources, open research data, but increasingly analytics as well, including learner analytics and other uh, aspects of that. 
It cuts ac across operations, particularly in terms of delivery of remote services. And we've seen no bigger evidence of that than during the COVID-19 crisis, where we all have to shift our services completely in a digital fashion in a very short span of time. But it also encompasses the physical premises, such as uh, introduction of labs, maker spaces, and any other physical manifestations that support um, mixed reality slash uh, analog to digital uh, conversion. In terms of connections, uh, particularly using digital to harness the connections within your own collections, but also across collections and things that were simply not possible before the advent of uh, digital tools and technologies. And there's huge potential there for us to do more and for us to invest in more. And in terms of audiences, particularly diversification of audiences, particularly growth in our audiences, the reach that our audiences can have uh, when you embrace digital properly, but also the, uh, the multifaceted purposes in which they will use our collections. And looking at audiences differently from traditional audiences to audiences of the future and who they would be, what they would do with our collections, and that could look very, very different to what uh, our collections serve their purposes uh, at this time. And at this time, you might be wondering, okay, that's great, but libraries and other cultural organizations have been doing or working with digital for a very long time. So uh, we've already embraced this change. What's different now? And from my perspective, I think we have more opportunities than ever before this time, particularly because we are and we will continue to live in a digital world. And I appreciate that uh, there are huge elements of research libraries, cultural organizations that are physical, but increasingly the emphasis would move further into the digital side of things. And instead of us now always questioning that, I think we have really have an opportunity to embrace it and to really push the boundaries of what digital can do to propel us in a leadership capacity in the global knowledge environment. And if you're really thinking about 2030, I think that is one goal that I would really want research libraries to uh, push for. We also have an opportunity to proactively develop digital leadership. Uh, it's not that long in this transformation or uh, that we can't do this now. We can really push that. We can really focus on digital leadership. And I do mean at the very top. And one really interesting trend that's happening in private industries at the moment is that instead of CTOs, CEOs are directly involved in digital leadership now. And that shows the emphasis that it has to be something that every part of the organization embraces. And we know we have a long way to go there, but we can proactively develop that, champion that, and push that. But also skills and services which are fit for the future. And that requires a different mindset, a different way of thinking about digital, particularly moving away from a physical translation of a service into a digital, to developing services which are digital by design. We also have opportunity to reach global audiences and build on their collective knowledge of our collections. I really want to encourage more crowdsourcing projects, more wisdom of the crowds elements into what we do. We also have an opportunity, and in my opinion, a very strong responsibility to challenge data misuse and algorithmic biases. We know that the world is digital. We know how things are translating in the future. And we've seen evidence of that again and again through what Cambridge Analytica uh, crisis, uh, through the kind of news we get all the time, the personalized feeds, which limit your, um, your options of what's really happening. And unfortunately, a lot of people, even in our research community, but particularly in the libraries and archives and special collections and museums community, don't really understand the ins and outs of that. We all know there's a problem. We don't know what we can do about it fully yet. And we have an opportunity here to start challenging that. We also have an opportunity here to identify and collaborate with new stakeholders. This is something that will be covered more in the manifesto, but I think we need to get rid of the boundaries that we've created in our mindsets that we work in higher education, we work in academia, we work in research libraries, and we really need to think beyond that. We really need to look at industry partnerships. We really need to look at non-research library partnerships, areas where there are fantastic exemplars of digital transformations. 
and start building our uh, collaborations and partnerships with those organizations if we really want to move forward at a high pace in digital transformation. And we really do have an opportunity to push the envelope here of what is possible. And I think one of the key messages that I would really want you to take from what I'm saying is don't limit with what we have now, but think beyond that. Think of what's possible and what role can we play in achieving that possibility. And I think that would be a really crucial thing in terms of change of mindset. I also want to share something that I really believe in, uh, particularly in terms of what approach we can take. Um, so there's, there was a fantastic article in Harvard Business Review early in May, which um, talked about digital transformation in higher education in the form of punctuated equilibrium. And I, I can see that I've worked in higher education for about 12 to 15 years now. And I can see that this is fairly true in all the different organizations that I've worked in. There are long periods of slow change, long periods of um, banging your head on the table, trying to move things forward. But then there are occasional moments of rapid adaptations. Response to COVID-19 is one of those rapid adaptations. This sounds a bit uh, unfortunate that COVID-19 is a crisis like none other, but we also need to make the most of the opportunity that comes with this crisis. And this is a great opportunity for us to really start thinking about what the future looks like, what investments we would need in terms of digital, in terms of leadership, vision, skills, partnerships, and staffing. And one thing that I would really highlight is the vision element, which is where do we see ourselves? What is it that we need to do? Why do we need to do it? And what can enable us to achieve that? And I think there are lots of things that the digital manifesto will cover as part of that as well. I also believe we need to invest in technologies and take risks. Digital transformation is actually now the new risk mitigation. Without this digital transformation, we are exposing our organizations and ourselves to far bigger risks than ever before. And again, COVID-19 has highlighted which organizations were ready for this transformation, which organizations were already in this transformation, and who's been able to mitigate against that risk far more efficiently than many other um, competitors of them. But it's also about uh, getting away from a, a, a completely evidence-driven approach here. And I know that sounds contrary to many beliefs that we have, which is we will always work with evidence-driven approaches. But a consequence of that often is the, the way digital transitions. It comes with research, it comes with experimentation, it moves into industry, and the industry to higher education to libraries transition often takes 10 plus years. And I think now is the time for us to flip that and say if that research is being conducted primarily uh, in higher education organizations, but also in many, many other um, commercial and uh, other organizations, we are in that higher education environment. Why are we waiting for the whole transition to come back to us? And we are not investing in this. We're not working with our research community at an early stage. And I think that's a, a mindset shift that uh, also comes with some risk-taking opportunities with it. I also believe we need to invest in developing an understanding of digital ethics, privacy, security, and well-being, not just at leadership level, but across everyone. And I think this is going to be in a really important part of what it means to be a librarian, to be a, a key worker, to be, to be a staff member in a cultural organization in the future, particularly as I've previously mentioned, algorithmic biasness, um, other issues, et cetera these topics will become really crucial. And it also bridges the gap between what science or hard sciences do versus what arts and humanities and social sciences would be doing. And as a library, as a research library, we are here to support all of those elements in the future. We also need to advocate for open algorithms. We need to minimize bias in training data. We need to acknowledge that we can't eliminate it, but we can definitely minimize it. And we need to develop technology insights across all uh, staff in research libraries. And I think that's really crucial because without those technology insights, without that level of knowledge, we can't really question why the ethical parts are really important, why the privacy parts are really important. 
and why it's really important to often be disconnected from all these technologies as well and to take a broader viewpoint of where the world is moving. And last but not least, from my perspective, this is a great opportunity for us to work together with each other to support each other in this transformation. Uh, Matt's previously mentioned this, that we need to work closely with each other, but also with new kind of stakeholders, new parties, and think global rather than local. And RL UK has taken bold steps here with its digital manifesto. And I hope you uh, also come on board with this, you also look at this, and you also see the opportunities that come with this. And you take an approach and come and work with us together to realize this manifesto. Thank you again. As I said, these are some of my views on this. I'll hand over back to Matt and I hope um, you, you stay and enjoy the rest of today's webinar as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Masood. That's a, a great way to frame uh, what's about to, to come throughout the rest of the webinar. And um, please do keep your questions coming. We're receiving these through the Q&A function. So please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom portal uh, platform to uh, to ask your questions as they come to you and uh, the, the hashtag on Twitter is also receiving traffic so please do continue to post your thoughts there. So I'll now hand over to our second speaker who is uh, Torsten Reimer who is Head of Research Services at the British Library. Torsten is also the chair of the RUK Digital Shift uh, Working Group and will provide a, an overview of the manifesto, the work of the working group and uh, our plans for delivery and what the future may bring in terms of the manifesto's contents. So over to you, Torsten. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, both uh, to Matt and Masood. And indeed, thank you very much for all of you to be here. Um, as some of you will know, we originally had planned to launch this manifesto at the RUK conference in March. And I think we were all as members of the working group really disappointed when that had to be cancelled because we were really looking forward to having a discussion with our community about this. In some ways, though, arguably, it's often been said that in crisis, there are also opportunities. And that's sense, I think I'm really pleased that we can do this as a webinar today with such broad attendance from way beyond the uh, UK community in a way that we couldn't have done this in person. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Now, as has been said, what I'm going to do is go in a bit more detail, building on what Masood has outlined um, about the manifesto and about the work of the Digital Shift Working Group. This is a relatively information-rich presentation as far as the slides are concerned. We've put them together deliberately in that way so that it's easy to share the slides and have key information at hand. I'm not in about 20 minutes or so we're going to talk about all elements of the manifesto. I'll give you a general overview and I'll then pick up some of the elements um, that I think also from my, you know, my personal perspective I regard as particularly important um, and hope that we can then dig a bit further into those and other elements too in the discussion and in the work that's going to happen after this. So that's the general idea. I think like Masood, I want to very briefly say a few words about the why. Why has our UK been doing this? And in many ways, I think for those of you who have joined, it will be quite obvious, but it's probably useful to put some of the changes that we currently see into historical perspective. I mean, after all, libraries have always changed with the needs of their users. This is a common theme and there's sometimes maybe a bit too much hyperbole about how digital changes everything. And we have to ask if that's always true and we have to question these narratives to be clear that we understand where real change is happening and where we maybe just see a gradual shift. We have now already, it's true, seen a very significant way in which our users are working, in which technology is evolving and in which society and indeed our organizations are changing. But the argument behind the digital shift is that we are already quite a bit in what's going to be much more a qualitative than just a quantitative change. That maybe a research library of the 1980s or 1990s would probably broadly still have been recognizable to say a monk librarian from the 11th century. But the library services that we see now in some areas that are run completely digital and the direction that we are moving into 
may not necessarily be. So libraries are increasingly quite different in the way how they look, even though our underlying mission hasn't really changed in all of this. There will be lots of good examples to pick up in terms of how technology has changed us. I'm not going to go into that much detail here, but there is obviously one point to raise that um, Masudis also mentioned that we didn't really think about when we wrote this, which is the novel coronavirus and the impact that it's already had. And one question that I think we'd really like to discuss and dig into a bit further is, is this just accelerating a transformation that we are already seeing? Or is it maybe giving a totally new quality in some elements? And it would be good to later on get your experiences on this. I don't certainly think that uh, it's going to accelerate some of those changes and it's going to test us in various ways, not just over the next two years, but it's also going to, even if in itself, it's not really shifting what's in the manifesto, it's changing the environment in which we work. So there's a lot of potential change, there's a 10 year horizon. This is a really difficult thing to get right. And if there's one thing I'm convinced is that we haven't gotten all of this right, but we were trying to do the best that we could in setting us on the journey and setting us up in the way that we can adjust. What do you do if you have a very complicated challenge which you know you probably fail in some areas but you still can't afford not to tackle it? If, uh, like me, you're a child of the 80s, then you think if you have a problem and if no one else can help you, then maybe if you can find them and if you can hire them, you can bring together a working group. So this is what our UK has done and here is a team photo that has most of the members of our working group and the others who couldn't be there are listed in here. We sort of came together not because I think we are a really good uh, crack team or, of uh, librarian commandos, but because we also represent working groups and in particular membership networks from across our UK. Our UK has a broad range of organizations that are involved and also networks. So we were on this group, not just because of the personal experience that we have, but because of the links that we bring into those networks. So therefore the way of the working group was very collaborative. Uh, we've met over a few months, autumn into the new year, usually in virtual form, but we also involved the RLUK community in this. For example, we use Jamboards, they are sort of online tools that you can use to collect ideas, think of this like a virtual post-it session to get sort of questions, inputs, concerns from across the membership. There was a face-to-face -face workshop then at the RUK members meeting in November last year. And throughout that development process, we had regular input from the RUK networks. For example, there was a session of the Digital Scholarship Network, which I'm a member of, that met in January and gave us really good feedback. That was then presented to the RUK board. And so we've incorporated some of their feedback. We plan to launch it and then have an ongoing discussion from there in March, but now we have the virtual launch of uh, the manifesto. In developing the manifesto, I think we started from assessing where are we now and in particular, what are we missing? What are the opportunities? And what's become really clear from this is that, yes, this is driven by technology, but as you can see from some of the bullet points that I've listed here, even at a high level, it's not per se a technology challenge. I think it's like I always find with technology, the question of how do you use it? And that comes from having strategic direction. We felt there currently isn't perhaps as much clear vision and strategic direction across the sector that would really enable us to sort of with confidence stay in this decade long transformation. And that's really hard. So we outlined quite a few things that we felt were needed such as having better foresight and horizon scanning. In particular, having the skills, I think, at all levels in our organizations, uh, ranging from some very advanced or relatively advanced things like artificial intelligence, but also to some challenges that we've maybe had for a while, such as good business analysis skills, service design and the like. We also found that generally there's a challenge, I think, in our structures, process and organizational cultures. Libraries in a way are sort of set up to sometimes deliberately not move so fast because amongst other tasks, we have to preserve something that's hard coded into our DNA. 
by this to a degree, that's something that we need to change, not ending the preserving part, but becoming more agile and adaptable. So there's a challenge in terms of having spaces that were designed and built at a time when needs are very different and difficult to adopt. There are also challenges that I think other organizations face from how can we make this digital transformation environmentally sustainable? And there's a set of challenges that um, bring us closer into a technology realm and Masood has mentioned them. So I just want to build on one of them. We are increasingly dependent on external suppliers because the challenges of building increasingly complex library systems using a set of technologies that are generally referred to as artificial intelligence are such that very few libraries can afford to play in that field. And even those who can, can only do this in limited areas. The problem that we are facing is not that there are commercial entities providing us those services. The challenges are that we see, like in many digital areas, an increasing marketplace concentration. You can also see this, by the way, in publishing, where the open access transformation arguably has even led to more market concentration. But it's market concentration with a few players that increasingly have systems and ecosystem of tools that are so good, they are hard to ignore, but they are closed. And that means our ability to serve our users in an open and transparent way is increasingly hampered by not understanding the technology that we use. And that brings us to another key theme, which is trust. We have to maintain the trust of our users and we have to have the trust within our organizations to work what's sometimes outside of traditional boundaries of libraries, because these boundaries are shifting and we need to build the confidence in our organizations and our partners that we can contribute something beyond what they might consider as traditional librarian tasks. So, based on our assessment, we come to a manifesto. And obviously, a manifesto wants to have some radical change. Now, if you read our manifesto, and perhaps looking back a bit a sort of critical about our own work, the language that we've used isn't maybe quite always as radical as some of the challenges that are hiding behind. It does say, in a way, ultimately, that what we want to do is, in some ways, retain the place that we have, which is being an integral part of the local, but also the global knowledge environment. Arguably, though, there are some elements in there that are quite challenging and that are somewhat revolutionary. For example, going back to the point about artificial intelligence, which are used as a shorthand for a whole range of technologies here. A key thing, and I'm really convinced of this, if we want to be successful, if we want to retain the position that we have, in fact, if we want to become more relevant and helpful to users across the world from different backgrounds, is we need to, to a degree, master these technologies, not necessarily to be able to develop them, but to understand how they can be deployed for making the world a better, a more open, a more knowledge-driven place. And I think this is crucial for libraries in general. And we need to find a place because what we can't forget is there are lots more information resources out there that are open, but there's also lots more control over key elements of the internet that isn't as open as it always appears. And I think what's really dear to me is that as libraries, we're here to increase access to information, to be open and inclusive, and that's an ability that we need to maintain. And we have to be a critical force for this throughout. And this, in a way, is perhaps the somewhat more radical message, that, if you will, that's at the heart of the manifesto. What is also at the heart of the manifesto is, in the end, it's all about adaptability. We have some reasonably good ideas of how the future may look like. Some of these may even be true. But broadly speaking, the only thing we can be certain of is that we'll have to change course. There'll be things that we haven't seen coming, or that maybe we saw come, but didn't quite expect wouldn't be so challenging or so important. So we've tried to organize the manifesto around what can we do to make libraries, library services more adaptable. And we've sort of broken this roughly into four areas, the four S, skills, scholarship, spaces, and stakeholders. It's a bit more complicated than just these one words, but we thought it would be good to sort of concentrate minds and have a few key themes. And I'll now quickly speak about those four themes. 
So first of all, skills, and I've added in brackets leadership. I would argue leadership in a way is the most crucial part in here. We are changing, our libraries are changing, and this will only be fully successful if we can enable our staff to make the best of these challenges and opportunities. And that means we need leadership that empowers staff. We have to give people confidence to take risks and to work in digital ways. That's absolutely critical. We need to look at the model in which we operate and it can't just be digital bolted on. It needs to be digital at the heart of what we do, amongst other themes, for sure, but as an important theme. And that will also mean that was something that as a group we were quite clear on, we will have to wind down services that no longer add enough value. And this is arguably one of the points that's become probably even more crucial uh, with COVID-19, as our resources across the library sector will not be as plentiful as they were, and I know many of us would argue they were never that plentiful to start with. If we want to master digital transformation, we have to put more resource in digital skills and digital leadership. And that will cost us more at the time when our budgets are under even more pressure. And this is really challenging, but the only way to do this is shift resources where they are most needed. And another thing that's also really important there is really think about what in particular artificial intelligence again will do. It will take away some jobs that are still valuable in libraries at the moment from automation but it will open up the opportunity for more creative work in libraries and our structures aren't always set up to do this, nor do we necessarily always have the right recruitment and training to find and retain an adaptable and diverse workforce. And a few other themes in there that are also quite important, such as digital ethics that was mentioned before. The second theme is scholarship. Um, scholarship very clearly linked to collections as a core part uh, of the library's work. And a key idea behind this here is that our collections need to be more networked than before because the answers that our users are looking for may sometimes be in our collections, but to truly get them to their potential, we need to link our collections to other collections and support new ways of working with them. But it's much easier to do if there's more collaborative management of collections, and that should also be cheaper. So I think a key point is manage both physical and digital collections together with others. This will be a key thing, taking collective approaches that will help us be better. But all of this needs to be open and inclusive. I think Masood already spoke about getting our collections more out into the world. Arguably, we also need to get them out more to the types of people who don't currently use them. And there will be losers in this change. And I think as far as society goes, it would be fantastic if we could play a role to help people who are cut off from some of these digital opportunities to at least experience them in our libraries. And another point that I want to mention amongst these here is special collections. Those libraries who have them, are really blessed in many ways because you might say special collections will always be there and that's true but we have to make sure that they stay visible in the digital world because increasingly we see that um, users will make do with what's available in digital form because traveling is too challenging. Spaces also very important. We need spaces building on a th key theme that are flexible and adaptable and enable experimentation um, spaces that are maybe somewhat less geared on print collections and more on bringing people in and allowing them to generate knowledge in other ways. And I think that's something that we can dig in a bit more later in the discussion. Stakeholders then was a theme that's also been mentioned by Masood and it's just based on the simple realization that we can't do this on our own. We need to make sure that we remain visible as organizations that it's worthwhile talking to we need to do work in the areas where we can help shift the overall global knowledge environment. And that will be particularly around issues like copyright and data protections and the ethics of information. And we have to develop more links, be to industry, researchers and the wider education sector to tackle some of these challenges jointly. And I think we should find partners that are willing to work with us, but we also should find partners that play along well with the ethical principles that we hold dear. Now, 
how are we going to put this into practice? At least what's the idea within the RL UK community? Broadly speaking, we've broken this down into um, three areas, short, medium, and long-term. The information on the long-term is relatively short at the moment. We focused more effort on short and in particular medium term because we think we need to adjust and adopt. Uh, you can see this is built around a range of themes that I'll talk about a bit more on the following slides. But broadly speaking, the short term, the next few months, year, year and a half, will be on consolidating the information that we have and better understand where organizations are currently and what we need to do. The second phase will then put some of these things into action uh, and help us sort of move forward. And then having set up the stage somewhat better, we then hope that we are well set up to tackle some of the bigger challenges in the following years, taking our stores 2030. I'll now talk about a few examples of what's in the implementation plan. I'll keep this relatively short. It's also high level in the plan, um, but you can follow this all up in more detail in the manifesto. A key theme, I think, in terms of understanding where we are is that we want to undertake a digital skills audit across our UK members to identify gaps. I think that's quite important. But as you will see, there's also in the same section mentioned the mapping exercise of key external stakeholders. I think such a skills audit would be much more valuable if we can do this in conjunction with other libraries and other organizations who work in the similar space so that we can see what kind of skills we can mobilize across the sector because training and working with training providers to help us fill those skills gap is much more effective if it doesn't come just from the subset of libraries. The intention is also to make some tools and resources available that are, or rather package up tools and resources that are already out there because there is interesting material. We can't and don't want to reinvent the wheel, but we want to bring helpful information together. So that's part of the work that needs to happen in the short term. And another key element in all of this is setting up a sustainable channel or forum for libraries to continue to collaborate and have these discussions have more activities like today than others um, and make this really part of sort of our institutional infrastructure. Along the lines also investing more in digital leadership skills and this is something um, that's very much on the plan for the short term. Medium term then we'll be building on the work that we've done. I'd like to pick up I think three key elements from this is one is develop a sustainability action plan for carbon neutral digital research library services. Obviously, library services overall need to be sustainable, but we need to contribute in particular at a time as we'll need more and more compute resources. We have a broad responsibility to do this in a sustainable way. Another key element then is creating a strategic workforce plan for the RLUK libraries. And again, I think this is something that um, while it's done for the RLUK members, could be much richer experience if we broadened it, but it's helping libraries to plan how, it can, how they can support and develop their workforce. And then finally, and this is really close to my heart, is develop, call it manifesto as head of requirements, but I'd love it if there was a consensus where as a library community, we could define, these are the principles that all information resources that we're going to license and buy need to meet in terms of being open and transparent. Something that would help us for procurement, something that we could use to argue in our institution the shiniest provider isn't always the best. And having an open discussion about this also involving suppliers would be a great and fantastic thing that if we do this globally across the libraries, it would really help us, I think. What's then in the long term? I think we'll need a bit more development, but broadly it's building and expanding on what we've done, having a constant review of the landscape of technologies, and in particular, being very actively engaged in the strategic workforce planning. I think this will be a key thing. We need the leadership and we need the staff skills to master this. And that's in a way at the heart of the manifesto. And I'd now like to conclude um, by saying, or picking up on I think what I hope was a key theme in what I've said, but also what Masood has said is, We've undertaken this on behalf of our UK membership organization, but this can only really work if we take this on as a global challenge for the library sector. And so there's an invitation 
to work with us, whether it's under the RI UK umbrella, some other umbrella, or just some interested parties getting together to join in and turn some of these challenges into opportunities. And that's the, uh, in some cases, relatively swift walk through, through the Digital Money Festival. Thank you. Thank you so much, Torsten, for that um, comprehensive um, overview. I think that's really fantastic to have that all, all laid out. And as Torsten said, for further details, they are available on the, the RE UK uh, website. Please keep your questions coming in. Uh, they are coming in thick and fast via the Q&A function. And please place any comments that you may have in the chat function or by using the hashtag as well on Twitter. So I'm now going to introduce our third and final speaker, which is James Hetherington, who is the Director of Digital Research Infrastructure at UK Research and Innovation, UK's funding agency for research and science. Now, unfortunately, due to unforeseen events, James can't be with us today, but he's been really kind in recording a presentation for us that he will share. Uh, Hi everyone, uh, really sorry I can't be with you uh, in person today, uh, but I'm going to try and do the talk uh, as a recorded talk anyway, and we'll see how this goes. Normally when I give talks, uh, I really rely on being able to see, see the audience and, uh, and, and tell whether people are nodding or shaking their head as to whether or not what I'm, going, what I'm saying is going down uh, really well or, 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 or really badly. Um, unfortunately, I, I haven't got that feedback today. Um, which, which makes this a little bit challenging, but, uh, but um, do send me an email uh, with, uh, with, with any feedback um, uh, you, you might have on the talk. Block capitals are always welcome. I'd far rather that than, 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 than not know. Um, all right, good. So this is going to be a talk uh, about uh, work towards a national digital research infrastructure um, with an emphasis on the... Um, importance of uh, what that will unlock in terms of the use of digital research methods in a wide variety of domains that haven't perhaps made as much use of digital research methods in the past uh, as others, um, which I think is sort of particularly relevant to the, the manifesto that, that's being launched today. Um, so let me uh, move on to the next slide. Let me see if my technology is working. Uh, yeah, good. All right. So um, I uh, just started this new job at the beginning of the year and um, spent the first couple of months meeting and saying hello to everyone. And then the lockdown started, um, which has been entertaining. But um, what I'm supposed to be doing is leading on strategy delivery for uh, supercomputers, clouds, data facilities, networks, software and skills that underpin computational science and digital scholarship in the UK. Um, those in this community will, will note that uh, we got the words digital scholarship in there um, as a key thing. I wanted to make sure that that was said. Or to make it less of a mouthful, um, data and computers and code and people. Um, and when we talk about infrastructure, uh, for me, it's really important that we emphasize that the, uh, the infrastructure we, we are building is not just made of uh, the parts that are made of metal and plastic. Um, but the, the 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 people part and the and the software part is um, uh, it, you know it, it, it is a really key part of that infrastructure as well, and that's um, uh, that's one of the things that, that I want to emphasise. Um, when we think about the the people that are involved in this work, and this has been sort of a key principle for 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 a lot of the work I've done, um, it's been the balance. And out between um, what we do to support other people's work and what we do as we consider the development of infrastructure for digital scholarship as a research domain in its own right. And getting that right within our research communities is a really interesting challenge. Um, and one so this slide illustrates an example of this. Prior to starting at, at, at UKRI, um, I worked at the Alan Turing Institute, uh, National Institute for um, Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. And this slide illustrates that balance between the craftsperson and the scholar with uh, two images from Turing's story. Um, the one on the right is the, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce this correctly, but the bomb or bombie, the, the computer that we use to, 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 to crack the German courage and win the war. And the one on the left is a sketch of the concept of the universal Turing machine. 
um, fundamental uh, theoretical advance in computer science. And that, that balance of the really practical and the really, uh, uh, you know, thoughtful and the really, and the, and, and, and the really theoretical um, is a tension that's always with us when we're, when we're working in these spaces uh, to create the, the, the underpinning capability that, enable, that enables that digital scholarship. I'm going to, um, I always like to put in a slide to explain who I am and why I'm telling this story. Um, it's a little bit egotistical, but uh, hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, and in particular, I think it's important when people get invited to give these talks and go, oh, look, somebody's giving a talk about being in charge of an important big thing and being seen to talk about the career um, explosions, the red stars on this, on this figure, as well as the, you know, it always annoys me in, in research talks when, when every, every piece of research is uh, presented as a uniform trajectory of success. Um, so originally, long, once long ago, you'll see top left, uh, I worked in particle physics. Um, uh, the switch on date for the LHC was receding at one year per year, and I wanted to work with some real data. So I went to work in mathematical physiology doing um, modeling of disease with computers, you know, diabetes, glucose, and stasis modeling. I did a long fellowship in that and wrote too much code and not enough papers. Um, and this is going to be another piece that to uh, spread that hopefully comes through in what I'm talking about. Um, we who work in uh, the infrastructure that underpins scholarship um, often get... Uh, I would rather live in a world where being useful in service and support of research was the thing that was successful in terms of advancing a career. Sometimes it's not. Um, and let's try to build a world where, 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 where being useful to, uh, to others is, uh, and, that, and that service within, within research domain is, is more valued. Anyway, um, so uh, didn't get lectured at the end of that. Went to industry for a while. Um, some of MATLAB uh, is my fault, sorry. Um, and then went to a startup doing climate modeling. This wasn't the logo of the company, but um, uh, I think it tells the story quite nicely, sort of the matrix and the um, extinction symbol. But anyway, doing climate modeling uh, in, a, in a startup, um, the idea was to, um, if somebody was going to pass a carbon tax, then we would be able to um, uh, use, you know, then complex uh, model, uh, mathematical modeling of complex uh, environmental systems would become part of the financial services loop and I would be on a beach instead of giving this presentation. Um, obviously that didn't happen. Um, uh, so I came back to academia and did a bit more physiological computing and then founded the research software group at UCL, working with researchers across the university to ensure that the software that comes out of research um, is usable by somebody other than the PhD student who wrote it with a standard of correctness better than, oh, the graph looks about right. Um, that's, uh, so that's what I did there and then went to the Turing Institute and now UKRI. So that's the end of the egotistical slide, just people know who I am and where I'm coming from. So I've already talked about the, uh, the craftsperson and the scholar, but there's another Turing story I want to tell to illustrate this, which is um, uh, interdisciplinarity aspect of, of, that, of, of that exemplar. Um, Turing took some time off from inventing computer science to also invent mathematical biology. Um, in particular, a, a, a model that we was suggested would explain how the stripes form on a zebra. Um, didn't explain how the stripes form on a zebra, but does explain how the stripes form on a zebra fish. Um, hence that, that picture. And um, the power that comes from bringing um, methods between disciplines, and in, the, in that case, you know, the use of, um, uh, the use of, uh, you know, mathematical models of complex systems to understand the life sciences, uh, an area that, 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 you know, until very recently didn't have much uh, digital research, uh, didn't have as much digital research in it as, uh, as other areas, um, is incredibly powerful. And I think at the core of um, the digital shift story we're, we're telling today, where every domain of science and scholarship is being transformed by the use of digital methods, and I hope transformed for the better. That's a controversy we, we, we would discuss over questions if I were here in person. Um, the, uh, um, and uh, within the context of um, the, the work, you know, so another project that I'm, I'm involved with, with my, my Turing research app still, 
Um, this is Living with Machines project, uh, that's a, a project jointly with, between Turing and the British Library, um, using uh, um, uh, AI and, and, and supercomputing to understand um, the history of uh, the change in our relationship with technology that took place in the 19th century. Um, and that's uh, you know using the the technologies that are emerging from our current change in our relationship with machines to understand the previous one, um, and we've got all the books, all the newspapers, the census, uh, the ordnance survey maps, and ferry directories from the nineteenth century in uh, in the computer, and uh, we're, we're 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 learning with that. Um, that's very exciting. Um, Another example of uh, an area that's emerging um, that uh, where the use of, of digital research methods uh, is transforming another area um, is in understanding the, the infrastructure that, that underpins our society, the physical infrastructure that underpins our society. Um, uh, models of trains, models of uh, buildings, models of transport systems. The, the quintessential example for this this work, which I'm involved with, which we, we, we call the National Digital Twin, um, is imagine, so step one, imagine if you could ask a computer, okay, tell me all the towers that have got the same cladding as Grenfell. Um, and we could use that to order the, uh, and prioritize the work to retrofit those buildings to make them safe. That's the first level. That's just the query level. We can do more. We can link that to models of how fire propagates through a building to uh, individual-based uh, models of how people move around in emergencies, to models of transport systems and of the road network to help us understand how quickly uh, fire trucks will arrive um, uh, at the scene and add all of that to our understanding of, um, of that problem. So, and that's just one example of how powerful the use of uh, digital research methods in that complex interaction space between social data because to do this correctly, we need to understand who is, the, who is uh, there and um, physical modeling. And again, so many opportunities for, for discipline boundaries to, to cross through the use of a shared digital infrastructure. And I'll, I'll come back to, to that because that colors what the work we're trying to do in how we build the national digital research infrastructure going forward. And um, the, the, the next area, um, just to touch on, is uh, work on um, uh, um, COVID-19, of course, um, where we've all seen just how big a role um, uh, digital scholarship is, uh, is playing within our, um, our understanding of how to react uh, to the virus. And, and uh, in my work within uh, UKRI's urgent R&D response to, uh, to CB19, um, which is the activity that uh, keeps me away from being with you today, um, we're, you know, we're really keen that this is not just about um, uh, the health sciences, uh, but a holistic uh, understanding across the disciplines to enable us to, 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 to understand um, the impact on, on, on who we are um, and how that informs the response, response as well. Um, and digital methods can, can play a part uh, in all of that. Um, I'm also strongly aware, of course, that, that the work in the virtual realm um, can more easily continue while we're unable to, 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 to physically go into our labs and libraries, um, uh, which is another interesting part of that as well. Um, so, uh, yes, coming back to this, this question of the nature then of balancing and the scholarship and, and the service. Um, I want to um, come to one of my favorite um, uh, exemplars, uh, which is the power of infrastructure, not just to respond to need, but to change the way people work. Sorry, this, sli I hear. this slide illustrates uh, perhaps a cliche now in explaining um, affordance theory and design thinking. Um, we've all many times pushed the push door and pulled the pull door 
uh, but we've also many times, sorry, I said that we've all many times um, pulled the push door and pushed the pull door, and that's made much harder if you make the handles like this. So the way you interact with the technology, in this case, it's the technology of the door, um, the interface stimulates the correct behavior. Um, this means that there are powerful cultural shifts and nudges that we can do with the way we design the technology um, to help uh, um, people use these technologies in effective and responsible ways. Um, and uh, you know, a, a key um, principle for me in this is um, how do we make sure that the uh, conclusions that emerge from digitally based research are robust and reliable? Um, particularly if we're going to be making um, uh, important decisions, perhaps politically sensitive decisions, on the basis of, uh, of, digitally, of digital research. Um, it's important that that work is auditable uh, and trustworthy and verifiable, and um, the design of the technology can help us to achieve that. Um, so, uh, one of the um, so in um, considering work within UKRI in uh, in this domain, then um, I'm, I've already spoken about the importance of balancing uh, utility, the service to applied research and curiosity, digital infrastructure as a research domain in its own right. But I've also emphasized um, uh, the importance of how that infrastructure can help to build community and that by working through uh, those capabilities, um, we'll, uh, we'll build those links and communities. Um, I've spoken slightly out of order. This is what you get for uh, trying to do a recording. Um, this slide is the slide that illustrates science being a political football um, and hence the importance of uh, auditability uh, in, and reliability in, in digital research conclusions. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the importance of um, infrastructures that are fit for purpose for working with sensitive, confidential or personally identifiable data which I think is really critical when we're uh, in the story going forward. Um, and in particular, one of my big concerns is, you know, many of us use trusted research environments that are a problem to use. Um, my argument to the community is this, you are just as morally responsible if there is a data breach because your system is unusable and so the research community route around it what I call workaround risk or workaround breach, as if there is a breach from your system. Now, people are like, oh, no, 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 no. If people violate policy, that's their own lookout. Yes, you may be legally safer, but you are morally responsible. And we need to maintain social consent for the use of uh, uh, data intensive research that can save lives. Um, but if we don't mean, if we, if, you know, if the, the bre breaches will, will, will put that social consent at risk. Um, so I think working on, uh, mechanism, you know, the mechanisms by which we make productive, playful, curiosity driven research at scale, uh, responsibly with sensitive data is going to be a really important part of what we do in digital research infrastructures going forward. Um, I, uh, that's a further slide that, that shows uh, the same thing. I'm going to move on. Um, another area that I want to focus on, I spoke at the beginning of how important it is that people are a part of this infrastructure. Um, we've had in the past uh, supercomputers that very few people have used. I once knew one where I knew the user, was a chap called Dave, um, because uh, we haven't invested properly in the support capability and issues around um, uh, capital versus resource funding have been really problematic in creating that. And so to this community, you know, I want to say that one of the goals that I really have within this role is um, building the importance of understanding all the different kinds of research technology professionals we have in this space. Of course, I've done a lot of work on research software engineering, but all the data stewards um, that, 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 that work to make the data um, uh, 
manageable, well catalogued, uh, discoverable, and so on, is, a, is another really critical uh, uh, part of this of this story. And I am I am determined that, uh, and you know, willing to um, to, to to make myself uh, unpopular, perhaps sometimes to 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 say how important it is that in order to generate value from this, we must invest properly in all of the research technology professionals that make uh, digital scholarship possible. Um, and I want to get away from the, frankly, um, sometimes Downton Abbey-ish uh, relationship between uh, members of the research team um, on some of this and, and parity of steam parity of esteem for research technology professionals is, 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 is a critical goal here. Um, making data FAIR, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, an acronym that will be familiar to many of you, is uh, you know, quite labor intensive, and our data stewards um, and related roles uh, will be a critical part of that. Um, so, uh, to um, edge towards a conclusion then, we've seen that the National Digital Research Infrastructure includes uh, not just computers and data facilities and networks and data centers, but also software and people. Um, I also want to emphasize that in this goal, it's important to recognize that this is a distributed and diverse infrastructure with a number of different facilities uh, supported for the long term on the coherent plan to reduce precarity and make people feel safe so they can work properly together um, around the country rather than a big one size fits all giant uh, you know giant style in this project um, uh, but one where interoperability and accessibility um, is a critical part of that design as well at the bottom line is nitty gritty stuff like making sure we have a coherent um, identity and access management infrastructure so that you know a researcher can a research workflow can work through many different facilities um, uh, without the researcher needing to have in about 50 different passwords and so on um, but uh, I think I've, I've talked also about how those uh, underpinning technologies uh, create the affordances that, 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 that will will stimulate uh, responsible use of, of these technologies. Um, to conclude, um, I'll come back to my nice uh, data and computers and code and people quest, uh, slide. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that ends the talk. Um, thanks very much. So obviously this will be the point where I would thank James, but um, have to do so in absentia. So um, that's really been an overview of where the manifesto has come from, its uh, role and place within the work of REUK, some of the contents of the manifesto and our plans for delivery, and then that wider context within the discussions of UK research, uh, digital research infrastructure, as, um, as James provided. So we're now going to take a short break. We are running a few minutes. Hi, everybody, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us again. I'd just like to um, welcome you all back and introduce the, myself for the next session. So my name is Sarah Thompson and I'm the Head of Content and Open Research at the University of York and I'm also a member of the Digital Shift Working Group. I hope um, that you found the sessions so far really informative, judging by the questions that have been coming in, there have been quite a few of them, that's certainly the case. Um, I do also just like to um, clarify that the slides are going to be shared and will be available on the RLUK website after the session, as will a recording of this event. So without further ado, I suggest we get started. Um, James and Tor sorry, James is, um, as you will be aware, not available to join us and has said that he can take questions on Twitter. But answering your questions live today, we have Masood and Torsten. So I'd like to um, open things up with a question from Andy, which is, what is so different about the digital shift? Libraries have been using IT for a long time and content's becoming more digital over time. So is the real difference the users who are now digital enabled and skilled in ways they weren't in the past? And does this affect how we think of the digital shift? 
I could throw that open to Masood and Torsten. I don't know who wants to take that first. If I maybe uh, take a start, just sort of building on something that I've said, I think it's a really valuable question um, because I've arguably very briefly only touched upon this. Um, it's sometimes easy to fall into this, oh my God, everything is new, uh, panic, uh, and it's changing everything. Um, so we have to question that very carefully. It is certainly true that libraries have been engaged in digital for decades. But what I would argue is we are now at the point where libraries have already changed quite a lot and we will see more rapidly accelerating change ahead. When you can now think about, and not just think about, there are now libraries uh, that say support higher education institutions that are run completely digital. So there are different models in how we operate. And in particular, I think, when it comes to the changes around artificial intelligence and big data, we're seeing a way where commercial entities can in certain ways offer something that looks, at least at first glance, much more appealing um, than many libraries can do. Um, and that brings that question that keeps popping up again, do we still need libraries or not, I think into, into sharp focus. Um, but it's also, I think, linked into this that we now reached a point where while previously digital came into the organization gradually it's now underpowering everything but the structures in which we work still haven't quite followed and i think there's a bit of tension there that comes from working in a structure and a model that isn't fully digital in an environment where the expectation is that we are competing against information resources, whether free, closed, commercial, what doesn't really matter, who have been from the ground up set as digital. And that poses both an opportunity, but also a risk to be increasingly not seen as relevant and to lose, I think, that part that in some ways is uniquely to us about opening up knowledge and making it more broadly accessible and not in the first instance only being driven by uh, commercial considerations. And if I may very quickly add a brief point on that, which is uh, to reference to the Sconnell Commission report called The Future of Academic Libraries, where they are looking at the role of a library in a multifaceted fashion, i.e. library as a service provider, library as a partner, and library as a leader. I think this would be an opportunistic time for us to consider whether we want to always stay in that service provider mode or to some degree, some partnership mode, and actually move into a considerable partnership mode, and I would argue a leadership role in this situation. And I think there's some food for thought there about where do we see the future of the libraries and what role should we be playing in achieving that, that future? Yeah, thanks, Masood. Um, we've had more than one question about um, future professionals and how, how can we attract them into the profession given the huge changes that we're talking about? Um, so we've had questions there from both Paul and Pascal. I'll just read out Pascal's question. What are the implications for the professionals that we need working in research libraries? And how do we best acculturate colleagues from other disciplines into our future work? Um, shall I take this one first, Torsten, if that's all right? And I'll, I'll give a very personal example here. So I'm, I'm not a librarian by, by education by any means. I'm a computer scientist. I had all my degrees in computer science. And it was very random that I fell into the library profession and realized that it's not what people would usually think about what libraries are supposed to do. And my view on this would be, first of all, let's work on changing the perception of what libraries are there for and that we are not just um, about space or collections, particularly physical collections, we are much bigger than that. And we provide value to everything that uh, we touch, basically. Now, the, the, the amount of that value can differ. I think, first of all, we need to really change the perceptional element of what, is, what does it mean to be part of a library in today's world. The second element I would add is um, also change the way information schools work and how what they teach. And I, I've seen a, a, a quite a considerable difference and improvement in that already. But also how we uh, advertise positions and what kind of positions do we advertise. 
And this is where Torsten's point about uh, we've embraced digital in some ways, but we've not changed the structures or the roles around that. And to James' point in his slides about what kind of roles should we look at, the data analyst roles, the data uh, support roles, the infrastructure people, the data visualization roles, there is so much more that we can play a role in if, if we just broaden that horizon a bit more. So uh, I think we need to advertise it differently. We need to look at different jobs, different structures, uh, different curriculum and information schools, and fundamentally change the perception of what does it mean to work in a library. Yeah, I would, I would second all of this uh, strongly also from personal experience. Um, I came into the library world through uh, history and digital humanities, so different tangent, but maybe some similar experiences to Masood's. And I would like to add one point into this. I think an area that's often mentioned is money. And you often hear these discussions where we lost our developers because they've been paid twice as much as industry. And I mean, that is true, but the answer isn't always as straightforward. So I've spoken to a few people who left the library sector to go into industry. And yes, they earn twice as much or 50% more. But if you hear more closely, these are often people who love libraries. They love what we do. They love working with the collection of the people. But they get immensely frustrated by feeling being stuck in an environment that doesn't support them, doesn't necessarily give them the career progression, or that sometimes resists what their best effort are to make the organization more digital and more agile. Um, that's at least the perception. And I think not only do we need to make it clear to people who have, let's say, digital mindset as a shorthand for way more things, that libraries are an exciting place, but we also have to have an environment where we support people who push the envelope and to help us change the organization. And that comes back to leadership, the organizational culture, and how open are we to change? And how do we give people who have the skills and want to make changes an opportunity to do this in a reflective way, uh, not always knowing that just because you know digital, you know everything better, but in a way that recognizes that contribution and gives them a chance to grow in our organizations with a career path, with a chance to push things through. And we'll then find that some of them will say no to the higher paycheck because they get a better satisfaction and better work-life balance than they get in industry. Brilliant, thank you both. Um, I'd like to pick up on a question next from Regina, who's asked, what is our responsibility for those audiences who are lost in the digital divide, for example, due to internet poverty? Which I think is a really important question. Yeah, I mean, I sort of take the liberty to come in first in the way that um, working for an organisation that is open to everyone, that allows everyone um, to come in, uh, this is obviously very close to our heart. So we do work with say local communities, particularly in St Pancras when we are based, but we're also looking in how we can be more active outside of London or some of the other areas where we've been active. Um, I don't have a, a simple answer that we can just flip a switch, but I think the first part is be mindful that there are people for whom we speak a somewhat foreign language, that there are people who are cut off, they're just assuming everyone has a smartphone, isn't quite as straightforward. And open a dialogue with these communities. They are in a way not that difficult to find, it's just having that dialogue in the right way is challenging for us. Uh, inviting them in, making it clear that they are welcome. I think that's the key part. Some of these people uh, are quite well able to tell us what they need, um, but we may be not talking to them enough. And this has also to do with the way how our buildings are designed, how we present ourselves to the outside world, and about really making people feel welcome and having an environment that's not just built around um, a relatively small subset of people who are already privileged with their information access. Yeah, and the only thing I would add on that is to put inclusivity as a design principle in everything you do, regardless of whether that's digital or physical. And particularly when it does come to digital, make it as explicit as possible, which is what uh, I have definitely done here at York, really highlighting that inclusivity sits at the same level as user experience, as cloud first, as open source, et cetera. So it can't be regarded as an afterthought, but as a design principle. Thank you both. Um, I had a couple of questions on a similar topic um, about 
algorithms and misuse of data. So I thought that might be something just worth um, a quick discussion about. So particularly around why this is the responsibility for research libraries. Yeah, why us? <laughs> I mean, I can get the point, but um, we are here to help people get access to information. If we use black box machines that we don't understand and we can't have a trust in uh, how that thing works where big publisher X shows data in at one end and uh, answer to your search query falls out at the other end, or recommendation engines, all of that. Um, there will be bias in those that we can be absolutely sure of, but if we understand that bias, then we can help our users to make the best of it. And there's already enough bias in all these digital information systems, not enough awareness. And I would argue, as librarians, we should have the ethical principles to recognize that that bias isn't helpful. And we should have the sort of tools in terms of how we work with our users to help people work around these biases and recognize them. And that requires us to have a basic level of understanding of how these technologies work. If we don't have it, we basically just pass through the black box with some form of bias and leave our users alone. Some will be able to figure this out. There are already users who research library discovery systems and come back to you with interesting answers on how your system is biased. And it's good to talk to them. Um, but we need to be able to do this ourselves. And no one can do this for us. I don't have anything else to add to that. Tolstan summed it perfectly. <laughs> That's great. As we've got a lot of questions, then I'll, I'll swiftly move on to the next one. Um, we had quite a few, because um, Torsten, you mentioned something around um, how can we identify things which are not adding enough value so that we can stop doing them t um, and re-divert staffing and, um, and resources um, to other areas. So um, I wondered whether either of you had any ideas on how that might be done. How do, how do you go about identifying what things um, don't add value anymore or which add less value? Um, Ms. Uh, Ms. do you want to go oh, first with that one? Um, just maybe briefly, yeah. um, I think it's not quite straightforward to say add value or no value because you would hope everything that we do adds some value, but I think we have limited resource and we have to see where we can make most impact. So one is, you might run a service that's okay, but another library might run the service really well. Could you reach out to that library and say, if you provide this thing to us, um, we maybe can provide something else in exchange. So first of all, I think it's not as simple as saying it doesn't add value anymore because it may not be that straightforward. How do we find out? I think there's a key part in looking at our own systems and what they tell us how our users use our digital infrastructure. That has to be done with some care because it's personal data. But I think we could probably be better in some ways doing this. Uh, another part, I think, is asking our users and more user research and engagement. Um, that needs to be balanced also obviously with a strategic view from, say, our host organizations in terms of where they are going and being involved in these strategic discussions to understand what does our host organization want us to achieve and is our strategy aligned? Uh, and what do our users need? And that means we need to have that discussion and we can't always just insularly sit there and say, well, the usage data internally looks quite good. We have to compare this to external services and to what our users and funders want. And sometimes maybe challenge them if we think they may think they want something, but we could perhaps help them in better ways. I also think it's about um, upskilling and reskilling uh, as well. And a good example of that, or at least an example of that, that I can think of is how um, physical resource acquisition and electronic resource acquisition used to be completely different processes in the past and how over time they have become increasingly uh, uh, together in a single package. And that required staff to upskill themselves and to, to use that. And in a similar way, I mean, just, just picking one random example, we ought to be considering how we do physical services, for example. And does that physical services really just mean physical on-premises services or do the same staff also need to consider how they uh, look at digital public services, for example? So there will be an element of upskilling as we move forward. But there will also be elements of reskilling. And as Torsten said, this is not about 
value diminishing. It's about change of behaviors and change of approaches. And some of this is theoretical. So for example, one thing that I genuinely believe in about 10 years time we will be looking at is the shifting role of catalogers and particularly moving away from uh, either original cataloging to more custom cataloging, but also investing in how systems are being trained through training data and other sources. And I can imagine a reskilling shift of some of those staff moving in that direction. Not saying that what they're doing is not important, but understanding that the environment is shifting and responding to that shifting needs at the same point. So it's, it's a transition rather than a sudden stop and start. Great, thank you. We had a number of questions about collaborations and working with other organizations and stakeholders. I, I'm not proposing that we touch on that now because I think that will be pulled into our final session. Um, so I'd like to just ask one more question, which is a bridge into um, the next session on the Mentimeter, which Lorraine um, and Michelle um, will be leading. Um, but we had a question from Tracy um, and a couple of other people along similar lines, which is wondering whether, given the major change that we've all had to make really recently um, due to uh, the pandemic, um, do, you, do you think that the current priorities and timescales for the digital, digital Shift Manifesto could be more agile? In other words, you know, the phasing that we've got and things, the timings of things that we've got in there. Um, maybe need a bit of a rethink. Um, but as I say, I think that does like, need, need us on to the next session. But if either of you have any comments on that, um, you have a one, one minute. <laughs> well, I don't want to commit our UK resources to something, but I mean, clearly we now have a scenario where there's much more working from home and working in a distributed way. And I would imagine that will continue partly because it may be a while until we have a vaccine at scale in society, but also because some colleagues may not want to come back and there are some other advantages. So there may well be something in there that we could look at now in terms of how you, how you sort of develop an organizational model that's much less physical building based and works more along those ways. At least that's one of, I think, probably to everyone right now, very obvious thought. But, uh, Maybe Masood want to close on this before I commit our UK to anything else. Uh, to be fair, I'm also not in a position to commit our UK resources for this, <laughs> but I, I want to highlight the fact that this is why we are having this launch to gather your thoughts, to gather your insights, to gain uh, where you think priority should lie. And as Matt and everyone else have mentioned from the very beginning, this is a global endeavor. While RL UK is passionate about it and we do everything to support our member organizations in this shift, this can only be done if it remains a global endeavor. And therefore we are all ears, I'm all ears. Anything that we need to shift more rapidly, please let us know. Anything that would be delayed or ha you have concerns about or should have anything, uh, any more insights on, let us know. This is fantastic. It's lovely to get your feedback and it will only allow us to do it better. So please do provide that feedback and we look forward to working with you in the future on this. Excellent. Well, thank you both very much, Masood and Torsten. And also a big thank you to everybody who submitted questions. I'm really sorry that we haven't had a chance to get through them all, um, but I'm sure um, some of them can be answered within the Q&A um, by typing, hopefully. So I'm sure some of us can leap in and, and answer those um, if it's a factual answer. But um, we do have some interactive exercises and sessions coming up next. So I think also a lot of questions will be, will be covered and explored in more detail um, during those. Um, so we'll move swiftly on to our first interactive session. So I'll now hand over to Michelle Blake and to Lorraine Beard, who are going to talk you through this. Thanks very much, Sarah. So I'm Michelle Blake and I'm the Deputy Director of Library Services at the University of York. I'm also the co-convener um, for our UK's Associate Directors Network and a member of this Digital Shift Working Group. Um, as kind of others have already said, we created this manifesto before COVID-19 um, and we'd really like to take a moment to reflect on our current environment and how that might impact us um, in terms of what we need to prioritise and how we have reacted in our organisations to the kind of volatile environment we've found ourselves in. 
Um, I know many of you have filled the form in already, the questionnaire. If you haven't, um, you should have a link and by all means, feel free to fill that in now. So the, the aim of the short questionnaire was to capture these reflections and experiences. And I'm gonna take us through the responses for the first three questions. And then I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Lorraine Baird, from um, University of Manchester and she'll take us through the, the second set of three questions. So you can see our first question up there already um, and it's I think unsurprising that most of you are based in the UK and Ireland but it's really great that we've got a representation from across the world um, and obviously as we've said that's one of the things we're really keen to do is explore how we can collaborate so it's great to, to have a real mix here. I'm um, just going to move on to the next slide um, which is um, understanding the current library background of the people that are here today. And I think, again, unsurprisingly, most people that have attended today are from higher education. However, what's really, really great is that there's representation from across so many different sectors. Um, and also there's a lot of people in that other category. So it'd be really good for us to explore um, who else is represented here today. So that would be great for us to do. Um, and finally, I'm just gonna move on to um, the third question. Um, which obviously COVID-19 has had a huge impact on us and our ability to provide services. And I think for me anyway, it's really heartening to see that perhaps it's a silver lining, um, kind of that it's proving to be maybe a catalyst for change for us and encouraging or embedding pre-existing ways of working at a faster pace. And I think it's really interesting that for some, it's been a revolution as well. Um, so completely changing the way we work and thinking about our services and processes. And I think one of the areas that might be useful to explore after this is, is what those things look like and how we can find out more about those and, and share those across. So those are the first three questions. I'm going to hand over to Lorraine, who's going to take us through um, the final three questions. Thank you, Michelle. I'm going to take us through questions four to five. Um, so the first question is around areas in which COVID-19 has exposed the greatest need for, for change in libraries. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, large numbers have voted for creation of flexible and agile structures and ways of working within libraries, which I think reflects the, um, the, the, the pace um, at which we've had to respond um, to the crisis. Uh, and the way that we've had to move um, stuff around um, um, uh, uh, in order to be able to um, respond um, to, to change ways of working. And I think there's a question around how we retain that agility in the longer term. Um, and then the next um, sets of votes were all around access to digital content. So around discoverable, discoverable and digitised content, freely access to free, freely accessible resources, and copyright and licensing um, uh, to content as well. The next grouping is around uh, digital skills and, and digital leadership. Um, so, so there's a large number of votes for digital skills and leadership in libraries. Um, there's fewer votes for digital skills and leadership um, for researchers, but that probably reflects that most of us are working in the, in the library domain. Um, and then uh, down the other end of the spectrum, there's, there's, there are fewer votes for investment in, in national digital infrastructure. Okay, next slide. And the one before. Um, so any other areas where COVID-19 has exposed uh, the greatest need for, for change? Um, and I think these, um, there's a number of themes that emerged here. Um, so there's a big um, number of responses around access to digital resources, particularly around e-textbooks, um, the need for more spend on e-textbooks and better licensing models. Um, then looking at access to digital resources, so more efficient metadata and workflows um, to enable better discoverability. Um, increased digitization of content. Um, one comment was that, that the, um, the crisis has exposed that actually only a fraction of our collections are actually digital. Um, and there's a need for more agile responses from our vendors. 
Um, the next um, big grouping of responses was around staff. So there are a lot of comments around long term, how do we enable home working, um, more flexible structures and roles, um, enabling staff to respond um, to new technologies. Uh, there are a lot of responses around skills. Um, how do we work less formally than, than we've been used to previously? Um, and there was a really interesting comment that actually the, the COVID-19 crisis has exposed the digital divide amongst staff um, in terms of their ability to work at home and, and the technology that they have at home and also their comfort with using technology. So I think that, that summed up um, the, the staffing responses quite nicely. And then there was a whole lot of responses around digital infrastructure, so investment in things like storage, data, uh, preservation pl platforms, those, those kind of things. And there are also a few questions about configuration of space. Okay, can we move on to the next slide? So um, the, the word cloud really summarises um, the, the responses that we had to the previous question. Um, so obviously digital, digital staff and need, um, but there's a, a few interesting ones there around metadata, models, discoverability licensing. Okay, next slide please. Um, and the last question asked about how RL UK should prioritise uh, what we do now in response to COVID-19. Um, and so the, the largest numbers of votes was around um, sustainability, a sustainable channel or forum for libraries to collaborate and share and also around developing a set of requirements for open information resources that will inform licensing and procurement for research libraries. Um, there was also a lot around skills as well. So there are a lot of votes for us doing a digital skills audit that Torsten mentioned in, in his introduction. Um, perhaps fewer votes um, on a strategic workforce plan um, and there's a lot around support for digital leadership skills. Okay, I move on to the next one. Okay, that, I think that's the, um, the last um, slide on the responses to the Mentimeter. Um, so we will be using this within the working group to inform the um, implementation of the manifesto. Okay, so if I can hand over now to William Nixon, who's going to be doing the closing remarks. Thanks very much, Lorraine. So uh, my name is William Nixon and I'm the Assistant Director at the University of Glasgow Library. So I'm a member of this working group and I am delighted to have the opportunity to infuse and engage you further so that you help us realise the manifesto and accelerate and support the digital transformation that we're all experiencing. I'm passionate about the digital shift and this manifesto and it's really fantastic to see the interest in today's, uh, today's webinar and also to see the breadth of engagement and interest across that. RLUK is a members organisation, but the Digital Shift Manifesto is about catalyzing and engaging not only the wider library community, but beyond the library community. And I also wanted to reflect a couple of comments from Torsten and Masood from their earlier sections. Um, first of all, that this is a global challenge and we invite you to join us, okay? So this is more than just Research Libraries UK, more than the UK. And also, I think, to think about, as uh, Masood was saying, think of what is possible, what we can do, what does that future look like? Help us to create that vision and to make those changes, to work in partnership with us, to support each other and working with new stakeholders so that we look beyond our own 
uh, our own community. The manifesto is it's anchored in the, the needs of, of the community. And we can see, you know, the, the exciting implementation plan over the coming uh, 18 months. But really what I wanted to do was to encourage all of you who are in other organizations, who are in other countries, uh, to look at the, the, the form that we have here. We're really interested in who would like to partner and work with us. We're interested in where people can partnership around the different areas, the skills and the leadership elements, the scholarship and collections around space, around stakeholders and advocacy, to really think about all of those areas. Which, which of those do you really want to bring to the party? What can, you, what can you provide? And are there any particular initiatives that you want to be interested in working with us around? So again, there's a number that are identified here. Again, we encourage you to tick all that apply. Um, and while I'm infusing and engaging uh, with you, um, you know, as we come up the next screen, we'll give, you the, we'll give you the address so that you can have a look at that. Um, thinking about other support around some of the audit work that we are looking at, some of the things that have been highlighted by Torsten and Masood already. Preparing us a report summarizing our digital shift work. Sustainable channels. This is going to be really important for us. You know, collaboratively, collectively working together, supporting the development of those leadership skills across the library sector. The program of knowledge exchange activities contributing to sustainability action plans for carbon neutral digital research. It's already been commented that how valuable that has, you know, as identifying that has been in terms of the Q&A and some of the chat. Strategic workforce planning and developing a set of requirements for open information resources. Now, what is also incredibly valuable is we don't know everything. So there's, a, there's an other box listed there. So we actively encourage you, please, to uh, give us your own suggestions, your own ideas of other ways, anything that we have missed that can help feed into the manifesto and some of that broader engagement. So if you are interested, and I hope you are, I would expect you to be, you've already taken the first step on that really valuable journey with us is go to rluk.ac.uk slash dsform and really we look forward to engaging with you and that opportunity to have that feedback. So I am just going to hand over now to Masood for some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we've had a fantastic uh, webinar where we've heard from different people, uh, we've heard different viewpoints, we've looked at different comments, uh, some fantastic questions, and um, we do apologize that we can't answer all of them, but we'll try our best to respond to them uh, as soon as possible, or individually we've responded to a few of you. I just want to um, highlight that today is the official launch of the Digital Shift Manifesto, and this is just the beginning. And it's important that we start with that mindset that this is a beginning of a long journey, but one where we need to think holistically about what we can achieve, but also think uh, more broadly about the impact of digital on everything else, including on our print collections, on our spaces, on our users, on our staff, and just generally across the sector. However, that shouldn't let us uh, move away from our ambition and I think this is what I really want to focus on on where's the ambition and that is something that this digital manifesto uh, sets that is something it encourages all of you to come and contribute to and I am really looking forward to what the next stage of this uh, can shape up when we work with you on this We've also heard some excellent presentations from Torsten and James, and particularly one thing that stuck with me from James' presentation was the intersection of digital with physical, particularly the models and the societal interactions. And it would be fair to say that that's just going to increase further. So what roles can we play in supporting that kind of research, but also challenging where we see things are not being done 
in an equitable, inclusive fashion. And it was really um, nice to see that in the word cloud, the words digital needs and users were at the forefront. And I think that just highlights the fact that uh, digital has to be done in conjunction with the needs of the community, but also in conjunction with um, um, uh, the, the needs of the users as well. So don't have much to add. I just want to say thank you so much for your time for your patience, for your insights, for your comments. This is, as I said, just the beginning of the journey. Please continue on this journey with us. William's shown the, the form. Please do take some time and fill that up. If you've not added your comments or your thoughts on the Mentimeter, please do so. And we look forward to working with you, to collaborating with you, and to partnering with you in this journey in the future. Thank you. Have a lovely morning, afternoon, evening, wherever in the world you are. And please do stay, stay safe and keep well. Thank you, everyone.